Christians pray and holy men will be gathered all around. Amen. What does it mean to be free? I've had a weird obsession with the thought of being trapped obsessed with my own personal freedom. This may be the product of being the youngest child, I'm not sure. But I remember several times in high school, I remember the window that I would stand before when I had a pass between classes, and I would think to myself, you know, I would get into serious trouble if I just walked out that door. The concept of freedom is, is part and parcel of who we are as Americans, am I right? As we approach the final stages of our presidential elections, we're hearing the word freedom quite a lot. Patrick, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. We vacation in New Hampshire and on every license plate is the state motto, live free or die. Freedom is no laughing matter. I looked up a dictionary definition, and there's way too many to count. So I went with the Oxford one, because that sounded most impressive. It means the power to, or the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants, without hindrance or restraint. And you know, I, it came to me that it's actually quite a bit easier to list the ways that we are restrained, like being trapped in a classroom building, than to list the ways that we are free. I mean, as I stood there at that window, all I could think about was that I was trapped in this building. I did not focus on the fact that I have the right to an education, that I am free to pursue learning. I mean, we value our freedom, but aren't we all bound to something? And some of us have more freedoms than others. It all depends on what we choose to be tied to. We could be tied to our beliefs. We could be tied to our rights as a citizen, our personal circumstances. Since today is the day that we celebrate those who were mothers to us, I would venture that some of the least free people I know on the planet are moms. And I know that it was during my time of life when my children were small that I was pretty restrained, the most restrained that I have been in my life thus far. And from my conversations with other parents and fish families, I think that I am not alone. We are all bound to something, even our needy children, even though we actually love those things to which we are bound. The Bible says a lot about freedom. I mean, in the Old Testament, we have Joseph being sold into slavery by his own brothers. And the detailed and rather circuitous way that he finds freedom in that situation. We hear the story of the Exodus, right? Where Moses takes the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And Christ is pretty specific about freedom. In Luke 4.18 he says, I have come to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's pretty specific. When we get to the other parts of the New Testament, it becomes a little harder to conceptualize. I mean, Paul, our first real Christian theologian, in Romans chapter 8, he tells the Roman church, through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit, who gives you life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Huh? Wait, can we back up a little bit? I mean, it's maybe all of you are theologians out there, but I have a hard time wrapping my head around what it means to be free in Christ. And I think the best way to ferret out a meaning of a complicated concept is through a story. And 
We have quite a story today in our book of Acts, a doozy. There are three different kinds of beings set free in the story that Pastor David told our children. There's the freeing of the slave girl. There's the freeing of Paul and Silas from jail. And then there's the complicated freedom that's offered to the jailer. So first, the slave girl. Through confession, I spent quite a bit of time trying to find other passages to preach on because I don't like this slave girl story. All I could think about was that poor slave girl. I mean, there are all kinds of red flags, are there not? I mean, she's a slave. She's a child. She's being used by multiple owners to exploit her. She's sick. I mean, what's there not to be alarmed about? And, and Paul does not come out smelling like a rose in this situation. He, he frees her from what we would consider the first century version of a mental illness. But he does not pay any attention to the humanity of this little girl. He doesn't free her out of compassion. He, he frees her because he's annoyed. I mean, she was drawing attention to him. She was calling him and his partner in ministry, Silas. She was calling them slaves of the Most High God, following them throughout the marketplace, saying, Look, look, here they are, slaves of the Most High God. I don't, they were in a foreign place, okay? And they were not wanting to draw too much attention to themselves. They did not want to attract the attention of the wrong kind of people. The authorities, the Romans, uh, anyone who might get them into trouble. They were just trying to find a place to pray. They were trying to blend in. And so when she begins her yelling about the true nature of their mission, even though she's right, he gets annoyed and he just says, stop it. Spirit, get out of her. And it's done. He doesn't offer her any encouraging words. No recognition of her humanity, no thought for what's going to happen to her now, that she might be in a far worse position without her talent. He, he basically took care of just one type of her oppression, am I right? When she had a whole lot. Now, normally I would get out my editing pen and I would just look at the Bible and say, I'm just going to not do this story. And that's what I tried to do when I was preparing for this sermon. But then I remembered that, you know what? It's, he's not Jesus here. Paul is most definitely a human being. He freed her from an affliction, but he couldn't see past that to free her further. So, I'll let him off the hook. I'm hoping that God took care of the little slave girl, and I'm going to trust that he did in some way. But her owners were angry. It didn't end there for Paul and Silas. They solved one kind of problem, but it got him into a much worse one. Her owners were angry because Paul had essentially uh, took away their source of income. The girl was no longer able to predict the future, no longer willing to even try. So they bring them to the magistrates and they say, they, they kind of play, since we're talking about cards, you know, playing the women card or the whatever card. They play the stranger card. They say, uh, they, they, they prey on the onlooker's fear of nonconformity. And they say, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful as, for us as Romans to adopt or observe. And the crowds join in. And Paul and Silas are beaten with rods and thrown into jail. The not-so-better angel of my nature says, huh, serves him right. <laughs> he didn't take care of that little slave girl, so ha ah, look what happened. And then I remember that they were not just pr imprisoned, uh, but they were stripped of their clothing, and they were beaten with rods. The slave girl was freed from her torment, but it led directly to a harsh and uncompromising punishment. Paul and Silas broken, naked, and undoubtedly in terrific pain, 
are shackled and thrown into prison. This brings our second act of freedom in our story. First we have the slave girl, now we have Paul and Silas. So they are in jail, and what are they doing? Around midnight, they're praying. Better yet, they're singing. Can you imagine that for a moment? They are praising God in jail. And what happens? They experience an earthquake so powerful that the prison doors are thrown open and their shackles are falling off their feet. Now, I take away two things from this freedom act. Number one, when God is doing the freedom, God doesn't mess around. God does it right. And second of all, we should be singing more. Because singing gets God's attention. Right? Yes, choir, not with me. Singing is a good thing. And it leads directly to our third act of freedom, and the most difficult one to kind of fathom, the freedom of the jailer. Paul is present enough, maybe he's learned his lesson, I don't know, but he imagines to himself that the jailer might be brought to a state of self-harm. He actually calls out to the jailer, do not harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer was enslaved by his fear of retribution, of what would happen when the, when the authorities discovered that his charges had escaped. And what the jailer says to Paul is, is quite telling. He says, sirs, what, what, what must I do to be saved? Now, is this to be taken as a, as a simple worried question about his present circumstances? How am I going to get out of this mess, he could have been saying. But Paul does not answer that question. He chooses a, instead to address a deeper need. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your whole household. Paul saves the jailer from himself. His desire for self-destruction, his fear of what the future holds, his fear of the cultural laws and norms, what those have in store for him, for his wife, for his children. As we know from our own experience, there is a lot to be afraid of. The loss of a job, the loss of a child, um, a new and painful diagnosis, a world where wildfires, tornadoes, droughts, and hurricanes are more a part of our, of our lives. A future president that we can't support. The list goes on and on. And how do we act, react to fear? We run away. I'm, I'm sure many of us have had thoughts at one time or another of self-destruction. I mean, tragically, suicide is no stranger to Fairfield County. But we run in other ways, too. We wish away our problems, turning instead to the self-medicating aspects of alcohol or painkillers. We blame others, turning selfishly inward, ignoring those who love us, who are trying to help us. And in the end, we end up destroying not only ourselves, but the relationships as, as well, we end up destroying or helping to destroy others. Perhaps compared to the three parties that were freed in our story, the slave girl, Paul and Silas, or the jailer, I think we are most like the jailer. My question still stands. I mean, what does it mean to be truly free? Paul says to the jailer, believe on Jesus Christ and you will be saved, set free, you and your whole household. But what does that mean for us now? Robert Frost has an interesting take on freedom. <coughs> he wrote that you have freedom when you are easy in your harness. You are free when you are easy with what traps 
you, what enslaves you, with what holds you down. Harnessed by our jobs, we are harnessed by our duty to family, we are harnessed by our needy children, we are harnessed by our government required to pay taxes. These restraints are not what Jesus was freeing us from, however. Jesus is freeing us from fear, from the guilt of sin, from ourselves. So do we need to be harnessed to Jesus in order to experience inner freedom? Well, another word for harness is yoke. Um, a farmer will yoke his oxen or harness his oxen. And listen to this word that Jesus says to his disciples. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Are you in prison today? Are you like a slave girl imprisoned by an illness, mental or physical? Perhaps you are like Paul and Silas, or know someone like Paul and Silas who is actually imprisoned by buildings of stone. Or you were trapped in a prison of your own making, like the jailer. Are you harnessed by fear, by shame, or anger? Are you soul weary? I heard that phrase from a student at Yale this past week, a student that was so discouraged by what was happening around her, so disappointed by her, her own powerlessness to do anything to change things. She said, Jenny, I, I am soul weary. The yoke or the harness that we accept here as Christians is one given by someone who healed people who prayed for people, who prayed for us, and who gave his life so that we might not feel the burden of our own sin. We are harnessed by love. That yoke is easy. When we accept that yoke, that, that restraint, we are set free to be who we are meant to be, who God wants us to be. We are new creations, and all we need to do is to spread that yoke, to show that love by embracing the love of our Savior Jesus Christ. We are free to love everyone made in God's image. That is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen.